Hi, Dr. Quinn. Hello, Daryl. Hi, thanks for being part of our conference today. Um, can you tell us and tell everybody here uh, what you do and where you do it? I am Vice Chair of Research and Professor at New York University uh, in the departments of OBGYN, Population Health, and the Division of Medical Ethics. I've been in New York about four years, and before that, I was in Florida at Moffitt Cancer Center. Ah, so that's a, a good reverse commute uh, or migration. Well done. Uh, I personally applaud that uh, as a lifelong New Yorker. Welcome. <laughs> So we're going to talk today about uh, what people should say to their doctors about who they are and what doctors should be asking or be interested in. Uh, and in a way, that's a good way to pose this. You know, it's not just about insisting that doctors ask, you know, whether you're a man who enjoys sex with other men. Uh, it's about doctors generating an interest in that you know, uh, to help uh, continue treatment and make appropriate choice making with the patient. Let's just jump ahead a bit. Let's say you have a doctor that has asked, you know, uh, you know, uh, is the man in front of him, uh, you know, are, are you a gay man, a bisexual man? You know, how do you see yourself? You know, what pronouns you want to use? Uh, is that fellow nec uh, next to you your handsome husband? You know, or, and or the patient has said, yay, I'm here and this is me and I'm your queer patient for the day. What if the doctor follows that by saying, no worries, I treat all patients equally? Yeah, I think that's probably un in some ways reassuring to hear that you won't be discriminated against because you've disclosed this. But at the same time, um, that wouldn't be my next best follow up question or follow up response is to say I, I treat everyone the same because regardless of someone's sexual orientation, gender identity, we need to know what what their goals are, what the goals of care are. Um, and it may be to retain sexual function for as long as possible, even if that means reduced uh, quantity of life. Um, and you can't know that if you don't have those discussions about what are people's goals and priorities in life. Yeah, and, and for many patients, and we hear this in our support groups, when they hear, I treat all my patients equally, or I treat them the same, or any sort of flavor of that theme, what really comes across is I'm treating you just like I treat all my white heterosexual uh, married middle class patients, or, or upper class patients. And that's, you know, good for those white middle class heterosexual patients that there's a doctor who has a style of treating them. But that's not saying you're treating everyone the same. That's treating everyone uh, the same way that you feel comfortable treating, you know, your whole caseload. Isn't it more appropriate for the patient to sort of challenge the doctor and say, well, does that mean you're going to treat me like everyone else? Or are you going to treat me like me? Mm hmm yeah, I think that's a good point. I think, you know, I also like to separate the fact that for the most part, um, except potentially in the case of um, trans women on hormones, you're not going to get any different medical care because of your sexual orientation or ge your gender identity, but you should get different psychosocial care. And that's what I think a patient might need to self advocate for to find out you know, uh, what resources on the team, because it's not always the physician that's handling that point, but pointing them in the right direction to social work, to nursing, to support groups that are relevant for what they're disclosing. So some sort of acknowledgement, you know, that yes, you're going to get the same medical care as everyone, but I recognize that you have potentially different or unique psychosocial needs than the majority of my patients. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about doctor, 
at least within our organization, we're also talking about the doctor's office, the doctor's staff. You know, it's it's like you're not going to watch a particular player on a sports team. You're watching the team perform, mm -hmm. and you know the quality, the outcome of that game is kind of, is dependent upon the team working as a team. So the patient could have a really cool doctor, mm -hmm. but if the staffing are just you know, racist, homophobic, you know, just to the extreme of negativity, that's a rather toxic experience and nobody's going to get better in that situation, except. Yeah. yeah, that's for sure. And I mean, and sadly, we have, you know, a couple of examples of people who are really rightfully angry by the time they ever meet their physician or um, because of experiences that they've had with scheduling or valet or security, uh, things like that. Um, so it's something that when we train clinicians, we tell them to expect. I mean, people are angry or scared anyway with a cancer diagnosis, regardless of anything else, but coupled with feeling that there's some sort of stigma associated with who came with, with them or how they're dressed or how they're presenting um, can make for a really up, upset, anxious patient by the time they meet the doctor who then has to overcome, you know, uh, all of those, those fears related to the care that they've got just walking in the door or the treatment that they got. And then also try to focus on what the cancer plan is. Um, so we really try to emphasize that while oftentimes physicians can be the captain of the ship, the whole rest of the crew needs training and needs the same training so that everyone is saying the same thing, singing the same song. And if yeah. they can't be on board with it, then they need to perhaps find a different place to work. Yeah, or a different ship or whatever. Mm -hmm. I love the ship thing because mm -hmm. it sort of makes sense in that once you're a patient, once you enter inpatient, you're on a ship. It's not mm -hmm. like you could get off easily. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you decide to discharge yourself you know, I mean, for those people who've never tried to discharge themselves, you have to go through two or three levels of people interrupting that discharge and trying to convince you to stay, you know, and then you have to sign off on a number of things like, uh, you know, if you die outside on the sidewalk, it's not the hospital's responsibility. But the idea that you're in this self-contained vessel and you're dependent on people for food, water, toileting, clothing, and healthcare. Mm -hmm. you know, you've worked, I mean, you work in a hospital now. What, what do you, I mean, you know, as best as you can, what are the things that you've seen and heard that just like make you want to pull your hair out? Um, well, I actually work in two different kinds of systems. So my uh, office is in Bellevue, which if you're from New York, you know, it's the largest public hospital. And then just a couple streets down is Tisch, you know, the regular NYU hospital. And there's kind of a, the stark contrast in everything from the lighting and the age of the building to the way, you know, that, that people are trained. Um, I think I'm trying to think of some examples I can say without giving away anybody's identity or anything, but um, you know, I've, I've heard staff and I'm gonna separate staff from clinicians like social workers, nurses, psychologists, you know, physician assistants. I've heard staff ask patients, do you think you got prostate cancer because you're gay? Um, just like we, sadly, we, you know, people with lung cancer, they say, is it because you smoked? You know, not everybody who gets lung cancer smoked. Some people never smoke. Some people quit a long time ago. If someone has a heart attack, we don't say, did you eat a lot of red meat? So people are often looking for reasons to separate themselves. So I won't get that type of cancer because I don't do that, but really cancer can happen to any of us. Um, even with, you know, with the, with the best of, of efforts and is, you know, comes with aging. Um, so the things I've heard that make me angry are when people try to blame or give a reason <clears throat> for the cancer as if it, and it's related to a, you know, a behavior. Um, 
another thing that it doesn't make me angry so much, it just makes me sad is trans women who don't identify with the prostate, for example, in their body and are not getting it checked regularly. Um, even if they've had gender affirming um, genital surgery, the prostate is not likely to be removed. So it's still present. And the anxiety and the trouble that they experience, I've only seen this two times, in finding a provider who knows how to examine them and knows what a prostate should feel like in the body of a person with a neo-vagina. Um, and it's scary enough to have cancer and scary enough to get care without having to search for a provider who knows how to give you, you know, unique care. Um, the other things that are off-putting are just kind of general remarks, maybe about two men or two women, you know, entering together and the assumption being made that that's someone's brother or sister rather than their romantic partner. Um, if they say, this is my husband, if a man says, this is my husband, and then the nurse says, your, your friend can't come back with you, you know, like not acknowledging the relationship that was just disclosed. Um, those are some examples. Yeah, we, I mean, we hear many from the patient side. Uh, I've experienced too, uh, where, uh, well, one in general thing is it seems like we don't have data to support this at all, but it, anecdotally, it seems plausible or makes sense to me. Uh, a great deal more theft uh, uh, against uh, LGBT patients inpatient than uh, out, you know, so if you have like a closet or something in the same room where that patient's putting in their clothing uh, and uh, the clothing gets rifled through more likely than for a straight patient. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually lost $20 that way. I was sort of semi-awake and watched what was going on and the person doing it was significantly bigger as best as I could figure it than I. So I just sort of stayed, you know, asleep kind of thing, you know, pretend to be asleep. But it was, it was really made me feel bad. Other time, um, a nurse, uh, I was inpatient for uh, overnight stay for a cardiac eval and, um, uh, and I was fine. It was, uh, there wasn't anything going on. It was just a mere blip kind of fright kind of thing. But um, a night nurse comes in to, I, I'm think, I as best as I can remember, drawing blood or just doing blood pressure or something. But then she wants to pray with me. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, like to pray away the gay, you know, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And it's like, you know, A, why would you think I was gay in the middle of the night when clearly I look like any other, you know, male patient in a bad nightgown in a in an overheated hospital room uh but the uh no nah, i mean it was it was like we we hear horrible stories uh so the staffing is just this you know you could have the best doctor coolest doctor uh, an out gay doctor or whatever but if uh, you just takes one moment of one staff member slipping or purposefully being bad person uh to mess that up the um Are there any defenses against that in 2022, moving into 2023, that you could suggest or think of for patients? Um, there's usually um, some type of office called patient relations. It might be have a different title in various hospitals, but it's basically the place to voice complaints and concerns. And really, I think most hospitals want to address that and address that to your liking um, because press gainy scores, the, the evaluations that people fill out from having a hospital stay either in or outpatient are very important to hospitals and they want people to be satisfied. So something may have gone wrong, but if they, if they fixed it in a way that was acceptable to you, hopefully you would rate them better than you would if it wasn't addressed at all. You know, there is also patient bill of rights, and those should be very present in all areas of a hospital or a doctor's office. Um, and any form of discrimination 
or stigma um, is usually contra to the to the patient's bill of rights um, and you can refer to those um, there's also patient advocates in, in some hospitals um, i give the the difference i was talking about the difference between bellevue and tish hospital and even though tish is a very you know opulent looking place and tends to cater to a more middle to upper class you know population um bellevue i think is a hospital that is so used to everybody being different from one for one reason or another because they they don't speak english because they're not documented because they're gay because they're transgender because they have such a rare condition that no other hospital in the city can take care of them um, I actually think there's probably less discrimination that happens in a hospital like that because they're used to it, whereas in other facilities and other hospitals, they might not see too much variance in, in humans and, you know, the, and the way that they present. So um, I think that there are, and as general, and you probably know this for sure, as a social worker, which has been hard to do during COVID is really not, we don't want anyone to be alone in a hospital uh, if they can help it. Just, you know, nursing staff is busy. They can't always respond to the calls. Um, you know, so if someone's there, it also sends a message to the rest of the hospital. Someone's checking in on you. Someone is asking if you got your medication. Someone is saying, hey, you know, my friend, my partner, uh, my husband is in, is in pain. When's the last time he had pain medication? And I think they step up their game a little bit when they know someone is watching. Yeah, and really what, a, what an interesting observation about the hospital, that city hospitals for, I don't know how to do a proper description, but you know, city funded urban hospitals do indeed see a variety of patients that perhaps a, you know, a, a, a major cancer center may not receive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that creates a, a problem for patients seeking the best care versus care that they feel comfortable with, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, we try to tell people seek the best care, you know, you could fight the good fight after you get out of the hospital, but you know, you need somebody who knows how to do the treatment. And it may be that your condition is so rare that only half a dozen people on earth know how to do that, you know, um, as opposed to seeking out, out gay or, you know, lesbian or, you know, LGBT cognizant doctors mm -hmm. um, who may not be the best care. But if that makes you feel better getting care or if that removes a barrier to getting care, you know, I mean, how many people in, the LG, in any kind of minority setting is going to avoid getting uh, a hospital appointment or a doctor appointment because they're afraid of all the other stuff that may come with that. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and that de delay is obviously impacts the opportunity for um, you know, uh, appropriate care. Yeah, I mean, the good thing about this relationship in, in New York City and, and hopefully it exists elsewhere is most people don't know the value of, of an NCI designated cancer center. They associate it with, there's a whole bunch of things like they're going to make me do a clinical trial. I might get a placebo. Um, so you might enter care in the city hospital, but in the, in the case here in New York City, there can be shared care between the two hospitals. And so you're getting the best of both worlds. Um, and I, I hope, I wish that more places had that exchange available. In, in the last five or 10 minutes of this uh, conversation, and thank you again for being here, what, what, let's just focus on what you can tell patients, you know, what, what you know, from, you've worked with doctors, you, and clinicians of all shorts and stripes, nurses, radiation oncologists, radiologists, um, blood technicians, um, you know, even the people sweeping the hallway can have a clinical value if they're having a chat with the patient during their downtime. And, you know, many times those are some of the most heartwarming conversations on earth. What can, what can you, insights from working with 
the hospital side, the medical side, can you give us patients uh, to help us as patients develop better strategies and better questions uh, to make our care feel more comfortable, warm, fuzzy, and ultimately uh, get us to a point where our cancer is irrelevant to our happiness. That's a tall order, but <laughs> I would say that, um, so starting from the very beginning, you know, more and more institutions are collecting SOGI data, sexual orientation, gender identity on the intake form. So you, a, a patient may be reluctant to disclose that information because you don't know what, why it's being collected or who's gonna have access to that information. So. If you choose to leave it blank and it's not required, you may prefer to tell someone, you may prefer to tell the nurse when they're coming in to do intake, or you may prefer to tell the doctor. It's also your right to tell anybody on your care team, I am telling you that I'm gay, but I do not want that in my medical record. So you have a right to make sure that nothing is in your medical record that you don't want to be in there. Um, you have a right to say, who can and cannot visit you. Um, again, you know, with COVID, it, it can be a little bit challenging, but um, you might have, you know, a family of origin versus a family of choice. And you have the right to say, even though this person is my mother, father, brother, I don't want them here. Um, and I only want these people here. Um, so, you know, exercise those things because it makes you also feel like you have some sense of control. And oftentimes with cancer, we feel like we've lost control, you know, over our bodies and we try and take control in any way we can, you know, through diet or exercise. But those are some other ways to kind of take control. If your care provider or part of your care team makes a mistake in some way, you know, calls you by the wrong pronouns, by the by the wrong name, um, mislabels the person who's with you, um, don't assume that they did it on purpose. You know, most of us make mistakes on a daily basis and we wanna be corrected. Um, I have trouble pronouncing people's names. You know, um, you know, they tell me that their name is Richard and I say Rich and they say, no, Richard, you know, you know that's the name that they want. I, I want to be corrected and I want to make a note to myself and I want to ask you what's the phonetic way to pronounce your name so I get it right the next time. So if, however, you correct them and it keeps happening, then there's a problem. Um, and I think over a, over a period of time, if you're not feeling safe with the care that you're getting, um, go someplace else. You want to go someplace a, else anyway with cancer for the most part you'll you want to get a second opinion most good clinicians will encourage you to get a second opinion and weigh out if you feel more comfortable in one environment than another um, you know we, we often tell people you cannot just put a rainbow flag in your window and that means that you have welcoming spaces for the lgbtq plus community People, the staff have to be trained. There has to be all gender bathrooms. There has to be a patient bill of rights policy. Patients in the know will check if hospitals have ATI designation, meaning that they have gone through a series of steps to um, show that they are LGBTQ friendly and have trained the majority of their employees. You can look up the hospital and what their HEI -E status is through the human rights campaign. Um, and I would also look at reviews. Um, you know, doctors get reviews, hospitals get reviews, um, and, and ask around. Um, another thing that I've learned is that I think there's great willingness of clinicians to want to be considered LGBTQ friendly. Um, in a national study that we did of oncologists, we asked them that if they would be willing to be listed in a directory. And then we also asked a series of knowledge questions and the majority of physicians got the knowledge questions wrong, but wanted to be listed in the LGBT directory. So it says that there's, there's interest and willingness in being retrained, but, but the knowledge may not exist. So you may have to train your clinician, train your care team in ways that make sense for you. And the last thing I'll say on this topic is 
I probably should have said this when we talked about things that made me angry. I once had a patient referred to me as a psychologist, a gay man with prostate cancer, who, when he was discussing what his goals of care were, said, I would rather be able to be sexually active for a shorter period of time than have a long life and, you know, be impotent or not be able to be sexually active. And the physician immediately referred him for a psychiatric consult. So I think that that is the writing on the wall for a person, if, if that's the reaction that you get, that someone can't imagine how you would choose anything over living long, you know, there may not be a good relationship from the start to, to build there. So find another doctor. Yeah. Perhaps the takeaway from all of this is find the doctor that you feel treats you. Yeah. And takes an interest, you know, mm -hmm. returns to the beginning of this conversation. You know, it's not just about asking, it's about being interested. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just about collecting SOGI data, it's about using it. You know, it's about noticing it on the chart. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, I know I've had little post-its put on my charts that nobody was reading, you mm -hmm. know? And, you know, my concern was, are these things gonna fall off? And then I realized it doesn't matter because they're invisible anyway. You know, to reduce invisibility is, a, is a, another way to phrase it. Um, but in any case, thank you so much for being with us today and for this uh, helpful chat. Uh, I think uh, we're all grateful for your research. We're all grateful for the care. You give your caseload. You have patients as well. And, and um, you know, I, I look forward to learning more from you as uh, you continue to uh, read the room correctly and or write about it. So thank you for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, we didn't get to touch on the fertility aspect, but I thought of something else that, that may be relevant. I mean, we, we don't like to talk about when cancer care is not effective, but it's really important, I think, for people in same-sex relationships to, for planning end-of-life care. Um, something that we learned, for example, that if uh, you might have to legally adopt the children of your partner or your partner might have to legally adopt those children you can't always assume that in the event of the death of one parent they will go to the other parent even if they're on the birth certificate so it's another important reason to find out who a patient support person is um, when you're planning palliative care so all of those things can can be thought about and, and addressed which hopefully no one ever needs but the reality is sometimes they do. Yeah, and we, we actually have a presentation already recorded on uh, legal stuff, and we call it okay. legal stuff. But <laughs> um, but actually, so we're we'll even though I, I won't say goodbye to you again, but I will ask you another question around this: the idea of fertility, that you know, the, the presumptions that doctors sort of imply during the consult: an older man, gay or straight, is not going to be interested in having another child. We, as men with prostate cancer, have to speak up about that. You know, um, to the extent that trans women are pre-operative or pre-transitioned, uh, if they're interested in having a baby, um, you know, as, as a, you know, a transgender woman or as a transgender man, the, uh, yeah, it would be a transgender man having a baby, that person has to speak up, mm -hmm. you know, and not let the doctor, um, you know, just imply and uh, etch into concrete what's left unspoken, um, mm -hmm. which I think is a good thing, a good place to actually end this now in that nothing should be left unspoken. You know, and uh, at male care since like 1997, that was one of the first things we thought we were so clever and pithy and in sort of uh, 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 pushing as a social work intervention that uh, for our prostate cancer support groups, we let no man leave unspoken, even if they have to burp or fart. You know, mm -hmm. they have to make a sound in the group. They have to make mm -hmm. their presence audibly felt mm -hmm. so that you know, people will find a way, a reason to be interested in them, mm -hmm. you know? 
And let's hope all doctors, nurses, and healthcare providers find an interest in all of their patients. So thank you again. Uh, and we'll have more of these conversations, I hope. Thank you.